Drivers and Danica, start your engines! Pull those belts down tight one more time. Warm up those tires. Hit your marks and let's go racing, boys and girls. NASCAR, IndyCar, Formula One, Formula E, NHRA, and local dirt track and drag strip racing talk. This is the fastest hour in radio. Where'd you go? Here's your host, Steve West and Dustin Harmer with producer John Myers. I was wondering if it was just a little bit too early to do as much math as we're about to do here. Yeah, why are you doing that so Uh, early? Okay, 7 a.m. in the morning, Saturday morning with three hosts. Well, two hosts and a producer, if you will. So three people in studio and two guests and 90 minutes. How many more numbers can I get to you? Uh, Wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, Am I using Common Core? No. Okay, because then I will end up with nothing. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Welcome into the Fastest Hour in Radio. We'll see if we can explain how we got things going here. I'm Steve West. I'm across from me, as always, Dustin Harmer, except for when he's on the phone and in Maryland. Uh, The guy (laughs) behind the glass over there is John Myers. Good morning. Uh, Welcome in, everybody. And here's the deal. In about 30 minutes from now, we're going to have a local Birmingham racer who has uh, raced in ARCA has done a little bit in the Camping World Truck Series. Who knows, may have an announcement for us coming up when we talk to him at 7.30, talking about Joey Gatina. Going to be in studio at 7.30, and he'll be with us until 8 o'clock. Then at 8 o'clock, we turn to a Talladega short track hot shot by the name of Cruz Skinner. We had him on last year. We're going to have him back on now as things are progressing for him out at the short track, out 40 miles west of or east of us, I should say. It's going to be a good show. Absolutely. So that means we need to get to as much as we can possibly get to Right here, right now. We're dropping the hammer immediately. So let's get into this. Last Saturday, Xfinity Series purported to show the future of NASCAR while also touting the present. Kind of seemed to do just that. Chase Elliott dropped down to run the Xfinity Series season opener for his old boss, now new teammate Dale Earnhardt Jr. Put that 88 in victory lane, edged another moonlighter, Joey Logano. On the final restart with 13 laps left, Elliott got out in front and held off Logano uh, in the 22 to claim the win. Logano settles for second, trailed by moonlighter Casey Kane. Elliot Sadler, then a Moonlighter in Austin Dillon. So four of the top five are Moonlighters. Daryl Wallace Jr., Brandon Jones, Daniel Suarez, Blake Cook, and Brendan Gaughan filled out the top ten. Under the new system, with a chase at the end of the season, with all the Moonlighters, nobody has yet guaranteed a spot in the season-ending playoffs for the Xfinity Series. That was a great finish, though. That was an outstanding finish. Chase Elliott beating and banging off of that 22 of Logano. A lot of people taking Logano to task now. They're watching him very carefully. Anytime he gets into anybody, they're like, Logano's doing it again. Yeah, yeah. That that was Chase, man. Chase was... He's yeah. like, no, you're not. He wanted the win. He, he really did. Yeah. No, you're not. Uh, we'll get into points next week because that's when things will start to change around. That's when math actually comes into play. Exactly. Daytona 500, Danny Hamlin saw the progress being made, jumped out of line at the right time, and got the push on the last lap, avoiding a block by Matt Kenseth, went on to claim the win in the closest finish in Daytona 500 history since the inception of electronic scoring. That happened back in 1993. One one-hundredth of a second. That, oh. uh, on the clock, that's 0.010 seconds. Amazing. Absolutely. Absolutely amazing. The win marks the first Daytona 500 win for Toyota, which is a little shocking when you think that they've been in Sprint Cup Series racing since 2007. This is the first time they've claimed a Daytona 500 win. They had a chance. There was three Toyotas up front. Yeah. Uh, (laughs) Joe Gibbs racing, second ever Daytona 500 win. That other one happened way back in 1993, first year of Joe Gibbs racing. Most people don't remember that that was the very first year of Joe Gibbs racing. Oh, yeah, it was. 1993, Dale Jarrett holding off Dale Earnhardt, the Dale and Dale show. That's right. Man, that was a race. Absolutely. Remainder of your top 10, the close but no cigar, Martin Truex Jr., second place. We were curious as to how that switch over to Toyotas was going to work. At least at Daytona, it worked well. It did. And, and you know, going forward here, there, there's one thing that I did notice, and I'm sure you noticed as well as everybody out there. We talked about it on the show. Was JGR going to be able to work with Martin Truex Jr. being that satellite team? Mm-hmm. Because they don't really share too much. They're, they're very yeah. selfish. They were actually giving him props. They were talking about him. And they were giving else. him props, and Matt Kenseth actually called him called Martin Truex Jr. their adopted teammate. Yes, he did, and that shocked me. I was I was seriously shocked by that. But it's great to see. We were curious what was going to happen with them. Hopefully, this works out for the best. Martin Truex Jr. Great teammate to have. We'll find out. All right. Keep this in mind. Toyota first ever win. Daytona 500. Denny Hamlin, Martin Truex Jr. Both in Toyotas. Yes. Third place. Ready for this? Kyle Busch. Harvick. Then Harvick fourth. Yes. Carl Edwards fifth. Carl Edwards fifth. Four of the top five Toyotas. 
They, and you know what? Those Toyotas, they were hooked up all day long. They knew exactly what they needed to do. When they did the do, when they went for the restarts, they were jumping out of the line, jumping in front of each other. They were steamrolling up front. Mm-hmm. Those Toyotas were extremely strong this year. Sixth through tenth, Joey Logano, Kyle Larson, then Regan Smith, Austin Dillon, and Kurt Busch. We're going to deal with the points race beginning again next week. Hamlin, though, secured a spot in the season-ending chase for the Sprint Cup. This weekend's racing Xfinity Series, getting the racing going with the heads-up Georgia 250. That'll air on PRN, Performance. Performance Racing Network and Fox Sports 1. It'll start at 1 p.m. Eastern, noon Central Time. Later on tonight, Camping World Truck Series will hit Atlanta Motor Speedway for the Great Clips 200. That airs on MRN and Fox Sports 1. Coverage begins at 4 p.m. Eastern, 3 p.m. Central Time. Tomorrow, Sprint Cup Series is at Atlanta Motor Speedway for the Folds of Honor Quick Trip 500. Performance Racing Network and Fox providing coverage of that. The event begins at noon Eastern, 11 a.m. Central Time. Kyle Busch initially claimed the pole, but the rear end of the 18 Toyota did not pass qualifying inspection, a uh, post-qualifying inspection, I should say. So he goes to the back of the pack to begin the event. His brother, Kurt Busch, takes the pole. And the NHRA's Mellow Yellow Drag Racing Series finds itself in its second event in Phoenix, Arizona. Going to be running the CarQuest Auto Parts Nationals. It's at Wild Horse Pass Motorsports Park. Coverage on Fox Sports 1 starts at 5 p.m. Eastern on Sunday, 4 p.m. Central Time for the finals. By the way, if you're curious... I just mentioned two races today at Atlanta Motor Speedway, Camping World Trek Series and Xfinity. Xfinity, yes. again, starting at noontime, our time. Our time, yes. Central time. They only qualified the Spring Cup Series yesterday. Mm-hmm. Which means that right about the time that we start talking with Joey Gatina here in studio, they're going to be qualifying the Xfinity series. It's an extremely long day for all of them. Exactly. So track. the PA announcers are already up and in there and ready to go because we've been, we've they've got there. about 20 minutes to go yeah. before they start qualifying. Then after that's done at 10 a.m. Eastern, 9 a.m. Central Time, right about the time we're off the air, Camping World Truck Series begins their qualifying round. And then once they're done, they gear up everything, clean off the track, put everything out there for the pre-stage and all the uh, pre-race stuff, and boom, here we go, and we're getting ready to race. Scheduling was really weird this weekend. Yeah, I'm not really sure exactly why they did it that way, but that's the way that they did it. All right, uh, we've got plenty of NASCAR stuff, but I've got some other stuff I want to deal with, so we're going to drop down, kind of flip things around here, talk about our one Formula E bit of news. The well-known racer Scott Speed, who has experience in Formula One, NASCAR, and Formula E, set to join commentators for the next FIA Formula E event. It's going to happen on March the 12th when the series goes and hits the streets of Mexico City. Speed's going to be part of the booth commentators. He'll sit in for Dario Franchitti because Franchitti himself Himself is going to be putting in commentating work for the Verizon IndyCar Series season opener that will happen that same weekend in St. Petersburg, Florida. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. All right, let's see where else can we go here. Honda talking about what they are feeling like they're doing when it comes to Formula One, and they don't feel like that they made enough progress, so the current overseer of their Formula One efforts soon to be shifted to another job within the company. Yasuhisa, Yasuhisa Arai is being moved out of racing. Uh, I'm just going to call him Alphabet from here. Uh, moved out of racing and into the role of Senior Managing Director for Honda's Research and Development Department. Going to be replaced by not one, but two people whose names I will not pronounce with any confidence whatsoever, so they get the name Alphabet 2. Uh, so Alphabet 1 going to become Senior Managing Officer and Director, Supervisor of the F1 Project. Alphabet 2 becomes the Executive Chief Engineer and Head of F1 Project for Honda. All those moves come up effective on March the 1st. All I keep thinking of who's on first. Who's on first? Who's on second? I don't know. I don't know who's on third. Well, I'm asking third who's base. on first. <laughs> uh, by the way, Honda's return to Formula One in 2015 plagued by an underperforming and unreliable engine package. McLaren is reporting that the power is up for 2016, but their reliability problems continue to be an issue. Arai, in one of his last statements regarding Formula One, said, quote, Honda is fully committed to the Formula One project moving forward. They better get something going over there. They're going to fall behind way too fast, and they're already way behind. Absolutely. Formula One officials have approved a brand new look. When it comes to getting cars ready for 2017, they purport that they're going to bring more speed into the series with it. Deadline for final draft of technical regulations pushed back to April the 30th. FIA and Formula One officials, though, like what has been proposed so far. So you're going to get wider wings, a wider track. So in other words, bigger axle, longer area. So Mm -hmm. you get a little bit more you know, stability on the car, wider tires to go along with the wider track, a larger front wing, all of them meant to increase your downforce, and therefore your cornering ability, which should all, theoretically, lead to higher speeds through the corners and therefore faster overall speeds. 
finalized technical regulations and parameters of these racers still going to have to be approved by all Formula One teams and the World Motorsport Council. But preliminary polling of all organizations say that they are behind that set of regulations. Did you get a chance to see that uh, that that um, 3D type picture that they had put out? I did. That? Yeah, it, it looks pretty sleek. It does. It look it looks different. It's extremely different. It does. It looks a little bit uh, it, it, like they were talking about. Kind of goes back about a decade. You don't have all these little curves and these sculpted uh, things that are pulled out of the cars. You got a lot more slab side mm -hmm. to where the the air just kind of goes right around it. But again, you've got wider, taller wings, wider you know the wider front splitter and all that kind of stuff. So it's if it does what they say that it'll do with the bigger footprint that they got out there, the cornering speed should be up significantly. Well, if you look at the uh, twenty four hours a day. Daytona, the the, the Daytona uh, prototypes, the mm -hmm. that almost kind of looks like that in a, some ways, a little bit more to in it, some ways, and yeah. that's basically what you have. Yeah, and they they're also including that halo. They're still working mm -hmm. on the halo side of things, not the, uh, yeah, the fighter cockpit look. Yeah, that's the one that I saw. I saw the one with the with the type of fighter F one cockpit type okay. thing going on. And, and there's there's a part of me that still says that might be the better way to do it because I think you have a wider range of vision. But again, I think that the biggest concern is. If they were to flip the car over and say it catches on fire, what's the way to get the cockpit off of the car yeah. to be able to get the driver out in time? And so I think that that's probably your biggest concern there. Yeah, we had a great talk about that a couple weeks ago, which you can always check out too. Absolutely, because YouTube. That's right. Uh, Formula One going to change their qualifying format this season. Apparently, they like what NASCAR is doing, so they're going to do something similar, but play around with it some. Hot on the heels of Formula One boss Bernie Ecclestone, get this, admitting that he would not buy a ticket to a Formula One event that he is the boss of. Yeah, that was, oh, oh my gosh, it was horrible. Is looking to shake things up to make the entire weekend more exciting. So qualifying, still going to be in three rounds, like we are familiar with at NASCAR, especially at places like Atlanta Motor Speedway this weekend. First round going to drop from 20 to 16 minutes. The slowest car, after seven minutes, will be eliminated from qualifying. The next slowest will be eliminated 90 seconds later in each 90 seconds until the round ends up being complete. I've so done in that. in other words, you got to go out there and you better qualify and you better be on it. I was about to say, I've done that in a game. All right. That's elimination. <laughs> qualifying two, Q2, down to 15 minutes. Slowest driver eliminated after six minutes and then each minute after that until that round is done. Mm -hmm. And then Q3, the final qualifying round, lasts only 14 minutes. After five minutes, the slowest driver is out each 90 seconds. Again, the next slowest eliminated until only two drivers remain to battle it out for the pole position. A lot of people saying that this could shake up things in qualifying, may allow some other teams to claim a pole that might not have had that chance under the old rules. I, this is a great idea. This is exactly what they need to, to throw something new in there, just kind of come out of left field, more uh, Brian France-esque type yep. thing, and, and really try and do something. This... I think this is going to be a good thing for Formula One. A couple of things to look out for in the Verizon IndyCar Series. The official tire provider for the Firestone, for them, Firestone, has announced they're going to provide a very special tire marking the special occasion that will be this year's 100th running of the Indy 500. The sidewalls of each of the tires provided for the event, both medium and soft compounds, going to be featuring the same white lettering, very small white letters. Firestone is putting the names of each one of the 66 drivers who won their Indy 500 on Firestone tires. Wow. That so it's cool. Keep in mind your two compounds that they're going to bring there. One has the red lettering of Firestone Firehawk. The other, if I remember correctly, is just all black. Yes, I believe. Okay. And then they have a rain tire, which I think has white lettering, but I'm not 100% positive of yeah, that. So you can actually tell what they've got on the cars. But keep this in mind. Indy 500, because it's on the rectangle and you're only turning left like NASCAR, you don't get rain tires no. on that. So this is just the red stripe and the black stripe tires going to have the little white letters of all 66 uh, of, of the drivers who have carried uh, those tires into Victory Lane. Firestone has carried more drivers to Victory Lane in Indy than all other tire providers combined during their time in the series that is that's going to be cool i mean that would be a great thing a nice centerpiece in your house to have a tire absolutely from the 100th running of the indianapolis 500 and congratulations out to andretti autosport new driver alexander rossi his name might sound familiar to you because we've talked about him in relation to formula one rossi's been named the driver that they are going to put in the car that they inherited when they merged with Brian Herta Autosport, as we talked about here on the show last week. Mm -hmm. Rossi said he's not giving up on the idea of being a Formula One driver, but it was his intent to drive full-time somewhere in 2016, and Andretti Autosport 
It's a nice place to land. Extreme, extremely nice place to land. We were kind of wondering what was going to happen to him. It's kind of sad to not see him in Formula One, but I think that this is going to be a win-win for not just for Rossi, but for Andretti as well. I agree. NASCAR Hall of Fame has announced their nominee class for the next class. Fifteen finalists from last year that didn't make it in all are back in this time around for consideration, including people like Buddy Baker, Red Byron, Richard Childress, Rick Hendrick, Ray Evernham, Alan Kowicki, and Benny Parsons. There are others. It's not the complete list. The five new ones added to the list for 20 possibles now include Ricky Rudd. He won more races than I actually thought initially. He didn't win a championship, but he did win almost 30 races. So he's strong contender. Owner Jack Roush. So now we got Roush, Hendrick, Childress, Ray Evernham, who at one point in time was also an owner in addition to his crew chief duties with Jeff Gordon. So a lot of owners that are still kind of building up here. Camping World Trek Series, well-known champion, multi-time champion, and most winning driver in that series of all time, Ron Hornaday Jr. We've had him on this show a couple of years ago. Engine builder, noted engine builder, and crew chief Waddell Wilson. And broadcaster Ken Squire, and this is interesting because this would make him a two-time inductee. He, along with the late Motor Racing Network host Barney Hall, they were the first in the media wing of the hall. And if you go into the media wing, you are given the Squire Hall Award in mm-hmm. addition to going mm-hmm. in. Mm-hmm. They want to put him into the regular Hall of Fame. That's not a bad idea. I mean, I like it. I, isn't Mark Martin up for Hall of Fame, too? Is it, was he was last year? year. He was he one was? of the 15, I believe. So he's in again year. this year. I, you know... Looking at the list, just what we have here, just a few. You know, Buddy Baker should definitely be in now. Sure. I don't know why he's not. Yeah, Red Byron definitely should, should be in. Benny Parsons definitely should be in. Yeah. Alan Kowicki, I think I could wait on, and I understand that you want to do it because obviously he passed away over 20 years ago now, but I think you could still wait on him and get some other ones in there. Uh, Ron Hornaday Jr., I would really have a problem keeping him out considering that he was the guy. He was one of the cornerstones of setting that series up. Yeah, and that's that's definitely a guy, a, a guy you want to have in there, his caliber. I mean, he's he's very, very ingrained. You don't know the truck series unless you know Ron Hornaday Jr., sure. So you got to have that. Okay. A couple of penalties handed out after last week's activity. So let's get the first one here if I can find it. <laughs> just, I just love how yeah, that, I mean, we're all over the place we're, here. We're, we're, I really we, have to admit it. We have changed it. things up so crazily this week. It's not yeah. even funny. <laughs> okay. On Wednesday, NASCAR dropped the judicial gavel on Furniture Row Racing, slapping crew chief Cole Pern with a P2 level penalty for the roof flap incident that NASCAR said was not within parameters as they were gearing up for the qualifying round the Sunday before the Daytona 500. Mm-hmm. Uh, P2 overall, not a severe level penalty. It does mean that in this case, Pern has been put on NASCAR probation through the end of the calendar year. So he doesn't get off probation until December the 31st. It's February 27th. Yeah. Dude, be careful. Yeah. <laughs> Just and warning like, you right now, be careful. Did they ever figure out, I mean, I know we, we've had the penalty come down, but did they ever figure out what was wrong with that roof flap? I never heard. I never heard either. I, I, I didn't see if anybody had ever seen yeah. anything about it. They didn't really go into detail. No, they haven't. Thor Sport Racing in the Camping World Truck Series and their driver, Ben Rhodes. Keep in mind, he's like the great-grandson of the founder of NASCAR, Big Bill France. Yes. Uh, they've been hit with 10-point penalties following Daytona after a post-race inspection of his truck showed, in, showed an illegal lower coil spring mount or two or three or eight. Uh, this is a P2 level penalty. For them, it resulted in this case a $2,500 fine against crew chief Kevin Bellacourt, as well as his being placed on probation through the end of the calendar year <laughs> in addition to the championship points mm. penalties for both owner Thor Sport and driver Ben Rhodes. Really cool news here. Xfinity Series driver Jeb Burton has let it known that his mother and wife of former Daytona 500 winner Ward Burton is now cancer free. Love this. Tabitha Burton diagnosed with breast cancer last March but put out a tweet Tuesday reading quote celebratory lunch with Ward Burton. We came here after my first appointment. Plan to celebrate here when it was over. Hashtag cancer free. Congratulations from all of us here at the Fastest Hour on Radio because I do believe that we all agree. Cancer Cancer sucks. sucks. All right. So let's see. Yes. Just sucks big time. Big time. Yeah. No doubt. Yes. Uh, By the way, the Ward family wants to depose Tony Stewart and his former crew chief, Chad Johnston. Tony Stewart wants to depose both of the Wards, uh, Kevin Ward Jr.'s parents, along with all different kinds of other people. A couple of drivers from the August 9th, 2014 event, Jessica Zemkin, who was behind Stewart when the incident occurred, another driver by the name of Chuck Chuck Hebbing, and they've picked up a couple of more witnesses, one crew chief and another person who was up in the stands. Uh, And they've also asked for a delay because of Tony Stewart's back injury. Uh, is this ever going to stop? No. 
No. It's not. Money hungry people. Okay. All uh, right. Tuesday morning, Stewart House Racing's website revealed who was going to be subbing for the injured Tony Stewart over the next few races, four of them specifically. Three of them, they say, were going to be Ty Dillon. Dillon was going to be behind the wheel of the 14 Chevrolet SS this weekend in Atlanta, as well as at Phoenix and Auto Club Speedway in California. And he would then give way to Brian Vickers when the series happened to be in Las Vegas. But it wasn't long before that was taken down, about an hour after first being posted, according to NBCSports.com. Well, later that day, the, some report, some of the report was confirmed. Ty Dillon, indeed, driving the number 14 in Atlanta this weekend in place of Stewart. And Vickers was going to be driving in Vegas, but they declined to say who the driver would be at Phoenix and Auto Club Speedway yet. So as for Stewart himself, he was on the phone with the Fox broadcast crew during the Daytona 500 a couple of times. <laughs> that was great. Said he's not close to getting back in the car, but would likely be at a race in the next couple of weeks. We don't know how his recovery is going really until March 9th, which he stated was his next scheduled x-ray, but apparently it's going quite well. He showed up at qualifying in Atlanta yesterday. Yes, that was great. Uh, as a matter of fact, on the Daytona 500, when they had him you know, calling in, it was like, you know, call Tony. It was, it was just like one of those things. And they're just talking to him, and it's weird having him on the phone it is. in the first place. But uh, it, was, it was really different. And then Wednesday, probably the biggest bombshell of the entire week fell and put both you and I into the equivalent of a nuclear winter. Oh, gosh, here we go. Wednesday. Ford Performance announced that they have come to a multi-year agreement to bring a big-name team over to Ford. Ah. Stuart Haas Racing switches from Chevrolet to Ford beginning in 2017. All four cars assigned to owner Tony Stewart, Kevin Harvick, Kurt Busch, Danica Patrick become Ford Fusions, beginning with Daytona Speed Weeks, getting their power from Roush Yates Engines, Ford's technical partner for all Ford teams. Should all else remain, as is, Stuart Haas Racing would join Roush Fenway, three cars, Team Penske, two cars, Wood Brothers, one car, non-chartered, Richard Petty Motorsports, two cars, and Front Row Motorsports, two cars, as Ford looks to become, again, competitive for championships at NASCAR's top level. Again, Chevrolet has been winning manufacturer's titles, I think, for every year of the past decade. Forever. Yeah, forever. Ford now is going, we got to do something, and this is a coup. Co-owners of Stewart House Racing issued a statement regarding the change. Tony Stewart saying, quote, I am proud of our association with Chevrolet as they helped build our organization into the team it is today. So he did recognize Chevrolet's part in it. Yeah. He added that this new partnership with Ford allows us to strengthen our position in the sport and ensure the long-term stability and success of everyone who was a part of Stewart House Racing. Uh, Gene Haas added, quote, Motorsports is an extremely challenging environment where in order to maintain success, you have to constantly innovate. It is true in NASCAR and it's true in business. We've enjoyed our success with Chevrolet, but this opportunity with Ford allows us to evolve while continuing to compete at the highest levels of the sport. Um, we got about, give or take, five minutes here. So let's go through this here, and I'm going to let you... Take the emotional side of it first. Yeah, yeah, the emotional side. I'm so, going to try and play devil's advocate here for a couple of minutes, okay? I, I just don't understand how you can... I, I talked to you on the phone this week. I talked to several people this week, and I'm still dumbfounded at this point. And this has been going on all week. I've been having a problem with this. I don't understand how you go from having two champions, two, two championships in, in the past four seasons and everything else, running as well as you do. You've got everything going in the right direction. You are a team to be reckoned with. Sure. You were outdoing Hendrick last year. Yeah. And, and now all of a sudden we're going to pick up and go to Ford? I, I, why? Why would, If it ain't broke, don't fix it. <laughs> that's, that's the theory. Okay. Let me look at it and try and do my best to look at it from a business point of view. And I'm, I'm going to try and leave Chevrolet, Ford, Toyota, Dodge, Pontiac, Buick, whatever it is that is. I'm going to try and leave all that behind. I'm going to look at it from the same exact reason that in 2007 Joe Gibbs Racing switched. Joe Gibbs knew. He was never going to be the top dog at Chevrolet. Yeah. That was always going to be Rick Hendrick. And at that point in time, back then, it was also Richard Childress. Those were the two. Those were one and two, if not one A and one B. Hendrick Motorsports, Richard Childress Racing. Those were always going to be in front of him. He was never going to be able to get out from under their shadow or out from under the umbrella, whatever. You, or he makes the move, in this case, from Chevrolet to Toyota, he becomes automatically, with the three cars that he had, because he had just added Denny Hamlin's car, so he had Bobby Labonte at that point in time getting ready to sign Kyle Busch into that car, and he's also got Tony Stewart, who's already a two-time champion. He becomes the top dog at Toyota. Right. Okay. Roush Fenway, not been a good team here lately. Yeah, they have dropped. 
Okay, This is not the elite team that it was back when you had Matt Kenseth and Carl Edwards teamed up with Greg Biffle. Now it's just Greg Biffle and a couple of rookies who are still trying to find their way. Yeah, and they're lost. Okay, so Roush Fenway, nowhere near what it used to be. Petty Enterprises, still kind of trying to find its way. Eric Almirola seems to be able to find his footing, but they still got to figure out that 44 car. Brian Scott's a rookie in the Spring Cup Series. We don't know where that's going. Ryan Blaney, Wood Brothers. Wood Brothers hasn't been a full-time team in a decade. Yeah. Okay. Furniture or front row motorsports. Front row motorsports has been a competitor at two tracks, Daytona and Talladega. And that's just because they're okay. Restrictor plate. So you take a Stuart Haas Racing with a driver who has three championships, a second driver who has one championship, a third driver who also has a championship. By the way, won it in a Roush Fenway Ford more than a decade ago. And probably, regardless of how good she is or whether she's not, you know that she's in there because she's popular and she gains sponsorship. Yeah. This four-car operation immediately puts Stuart Haas at the top of the pecking order in a Ford. It does. And, and, and it I, gets them, like Joe Gibbs Racing, out from under the umbrella of their parent company because they were getting their chassis and they were getting their engines from Hendrick Motorsports. They're going to go. They're going to get their engines. They're going to start building their own chassis. They were always building their own bodies. So they're going to bring more of it in-house now. They become the top dog at Ford. Instead of being, you know, as they say in, in you know, horse, horse or dog racing, unless you're the one in front, the view is always the same. So yeah, but, uh, you know, it, go ahead, John. It, it's basically a business decision. This to is to all Ford. business. This it, is all business. It is business, but at the same time, you know, you want your business to thrive. You want your business to do good. You don't want to downgrade your business. Yeah. And and this is, not, I'm not, I'm. you know what, I'm going to knock the Fords. Why? This is why. They deserve it. They, they deserve it right to. Now. The only thing that's nothing. done any good has been Team Penske. Yeah, that, that's it. If it wasn't for Penske, you wouldn't even hear about Ford each week, each race week, because yeah, they don't show up. We had both the Team Penske cars in there, and correct me if I'm wrong, the, we, uh, we didn't have any other Fords in the chase, did we? Um, well, I take that back. I think we had Eric Almirola. Yeah, well, he was there till the uh, first yeah, couple until races. the first cutout. He just made it, and then he was gone. But we, we, he was one of the first going to be cut anyway. Yeah. Fords, he just Fords didn't have, have not it. been all that prevalent when it comes to yeah, the chase. They don't have the speed. They don't have the engine. They don't have the power. They don't have what it takes to do what they need to do on a weekly basis on those other teams. Yeah, Rod, Roger Penske, that that duo over there of Logano and and. Uh, Kislowski. Yeah. That's it. That's all That's Ford's all got. got. Uh, on on a non-emotional side, I see where it is. You get to get out from under a team that you're never going to be better than. Yeah. You know, because Hendrick Motorsports is always going to be the top dog at Chevrolet. So you become the top dog at Ford. On an emotional side, I don't know what what I can buy anymore. <laughs> uh, yeah, because I'll tell you right now, I'm not buying nothing. I got one I'm Ford, not a Ford guy. I got one Ford die cast, and that will never be removed, and that's Davey Allison. Yeah, I am not a Ford guy. I've no. never been a Ford guy. The Ford that I own, I inherited from my father. It wouldn't have been my choice, quite frankly, number one. And number two, uh, my grandfather worked for General Motors. It's really hard for me to look at this and go, I, I just want to scream why. Well, I figured it out. Tony Stewart, Gene Haas spent way too much time in Las Vegas gambling. That may be right, too. We got to take a break. Joey Gatina, when we get back. Oh, yeah. You're listening to the fastest hour in radio on Superstation 101. Springtime is almost among us, and with spring comes new things, like spring cleaning and starting fresh. How about this spring be the time you start fresh and finally put down those cigarettes? This could be the best time to finally do what you've always wanted, whether it be for yourself or for loved ones. You can finally drop those cigarettes with the help of Wild Vapors in Silicaga and Alexander City. Eddie and Shelly, the owners, were once former smokers themselves. They knew firsthand the struggle. They started Wild Vapors because they knew they could offer something the other places couldn't. They have their very own signature formula that has helped so many others to finally put down cigarettes. With their unique blend, they use only the highest USB ingredients and leave out all those artificial sweeteners and other unnecessary chemicals, all made up in an off-site clean room. They're located in the Silicaga Walmart Shopping Center and Alexander City, but they can also take orders over the phone and mail in your products. Call 256-369-2569. That's 256-369-2569. Stay on track with Wild Vapors. Ryan Newman wins the Goodies Fast Relief 500. Hi, this is Ryan Newman. Being a race car driver has its perks, yet I can't think of anyone who deserves better service and support than our nation's veterans and service members. That's why VA and DOD have created eBenefits. eBenefits gives fast track, 24-7 access to the military and VA benefits and information you need most. Go to www.ebenefits.com. 
www.va.gov or just do a search for VA eBenefits. Brought to you by the Department of Veterans Affairs. Hi guys, Jim here from Shop Talk inviting you to tune in every Saturday from noon to two right here on Superstation 101. We're going to talk about your car, somebody else's car, maybe my car. Tune in every week right here at noon to two on Superstation 101. Hello, this is Jay Schiller, 2015 track champion, Talladega Short Track. You are listening to the fastest hour on radio, 101.1 WYDE. Four new tires and a tank of gas. And we're back to the fastest hour in radio on Superstation 101. Welcome back in. You are listening to the Fastest Hour in Radio on Superstation 101 WYDE. Some highlights of Daytona. Yeah, absolutely. I feel like I'm at Daytona right now. It just sounds good. I know. It's like being at Talladega, too. I just love it. Uh, welcome back in. Myself, Dustin Harmer, jo- joined by Joey Jatina. And I understand that I have been uh, pronouncing your name all wrong, and I apologize for that. No, that's good. It's, uh, Jatina, it's Italian, so the G more is like a J, I guess you'd say. All right. Well, very cool. Very cool to have you in studio because yeah. you are a local product here. You're from the Pelham area, number one, and you're uh, working on trying to make it big here. We've been talking over the past few years about wanting to see more of an Alabama presence. Obviously, we all remember the Alabama gang from Red Farmer to Bobby and Donnie Allison and all those guys. Uh, we, we've been missing that, though. So we got Daryl Bubba Wallace Jr., obviously, he's from South Alabama. Grant Enfinger is starting to make some moves from Fairhope, Alabama in the Camping World Truck Series. You're working on some projects as well, from what we understand. Well, the sport's changed a ton, as we all know. Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, um, it's basically funding. Um, you know, for me to get this opportunity, you know, I've done it on my own the hard way. I guess you say we talked about all the great legends, how they started – uh, how they got in the sport. That's kind of the, the path that I'm on right now. Um, solely, you know, not giving up. Uh, we don't have the, the, the path laid out for us where we can just go and do what we want. We just have to continue working. And, you know, it, we started back when I was 21. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm not going to say, well, I'm 36 now, but <laughs> I know in racing terms, that's pretty much you're done, you know, but uh, that's not the case, I don't believe. But, um, 21, I started out at Birmingham International Raceway. Um, know it well. Yeah, and, and I'll tell you how great it was. We had to, uh, you know, I bought a car out of the junkyard uh, for $800, <laughs> and we didn't have enough money to buy a battery for the race car. Oh, my take, gosh. I had to take it out of the truck to put in the race car, and, and I got the question when they said, what if you wreck? How are you going to get back home if you destroy your battery? <laughs> <laughs> I we'll never worry about that when we get there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No big deal. That'll never happen. So we started out from there, and, you know, the, the whole thing was is, uh, you know, making it to Daytona, obviously Talladega. Um, yeah. I, got, I got to do that in 2014. Uh, in the Arca series, and then uh, the goal was the next goal was to Daytona, mm-hmm. and um, we did that. I, I think in the third grade, I wouldn't go to Daytona until I was a driver. Okay, and this year I got to actually roll through the gates as a driver. Obviously, not the results that we wanted, but uh, we went down there with the cards up against us. Um, yeah. And, um, you know, you got to be in the top 30 in speed. And, and we were close. I, I think we, uh, you know, ultimately had probably seven hours we put total working on that race car to go mm-hmm. to Daytona. Okay. Uh, we had a locked-in opportunity. Uh, matter of fact, we had uh, the, the chance to run in fingers number down there. Oh. Uh, and, and my guys decided to turn it down and let's go after it the right way. And, uh I'll admit, I like the confidence yeah, there. I know. Yeah. We, we get, <laughs> well, and it shows me that they, they felt confident enough to where you you felt they felt that you would be able to make it in on speed. It would have been nice, though, to have that buffer. Absolutely. I mean, you just, I, I don't know, given the chance, I wouldn't, I, I, you know, I'd, I'd much rather race. I wouldn't have cared what number was on the side of the car. <laughs> uh, the car was so good. I mean, the first time, you know, like I said, on the speedway is a lot different from the laps I have at Talladega. Uh, but the car was just so good. Uh, in the draft, is you know we stayed with all the leaders pretty much all weekend mm-hmm. long. Um, <clears throat> and the thing was, is we just couldn't we couldn't pull out. The car wouldn't suck up. We had that major issue, and uh, but we could hang with the leaders, and okay. we can you know I led the group on the bottom of the track for about five laps, and that was pretty cool looking up and <laughs> run around Daytona. You got all the fast guys behind you there for a little bit. So, and we just got a bad qualifying draw too. That that didn't help. Uh, okay. You know, ARCA does the group qualifying situation, right. and, and we got put with some slower cars that didn't have the Ilmores in them. So it's basically two race cars up against the other groups that had five. Mm. So that was 
that was tough. I had yeah. Earl Bourbon, Jimmy Johnson spotter up in the box for me. Even Earl couldn't make me go any faster. So, uh, <laughs> oh wow! But what an experience! I mean, like I said, I took the good with the bad. It was a beautiful weekend. Uh, no I, I could be really upset about not making the race, but as far as a goal standpoint for a kid that they said couldn't do anything or couldn't make it anywhere, you know, <laughs> I've made it to Daytona. So, um, yeah. I, you know, we've got the one truck start, not much to talk about there, but, uh, we got some cool things happening. I'm pretty excited about it. Okay. Well, I, I, we were sort of talking about it last week. We gave you massive props, you and the team, uh, when we were talking about the fact that you guys didn't rest on that, that uh, the, the provisional to step back on. You guys were going to race for it. And we were talking about it right here on the show uh -huh. about how a lot of guys, you know, they kind of do that. You know, you get to make the dance, but to make the dance the way that you would is exactly why we, we really gave you props. So we were very, very proud of you representing yeah. Alabama the way you did down there at Daytona. Yeah, and like I said, the, the only thing that, you know, realistically, you know, you got guys work, they work months on their race cars for yeah. Daytona. Sure. We had eight hours. Uh, we literally bought this car from uh, uh, Sarah Cornette, ran this car to test. The way it came off the racetrack is the way we got it. Uh, yes, there were some things they moved around and stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, it took us, I think, uh, once we left, the car was in Sneeds Ferry, which is eight hours from where we live here. So we drove eight hours. We got up there at noon. We worked till two in the morning, and we got back in the truck to drive back home to Alabama. So that's the extent of how long we had to wow. prepare. And then we had a seat that, you know, we couldn't get in the race car. You know, oh, so they no. had to work on that. Oh, man. So uh, that took them a few extra days. But, yeah, ultimately... You know, that was the only thing. We we just didn't have enough time to prepare. It came together so late. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I, I do. I, I, I like the confidence. I had the confidence of myself going down there. Sure. I mean, uh, from a driver's perspective, what do we do? We match the gas and turn the wheel. Um, you know, with an Ilmore, um, you know, pretty much you, you feel like your, your faith is sealed on a super speedway with those mm -hmm. motors. Uh, for some reason, we just couldn't seem to get there. We, we had a, a 310 in the car to begin with gear wise and and we ran you know we had a pretty good first practice i think we were 185 and some change up there and then we decided we'd make a change after talking to some of the other guys and bobby hamilton jr helped out a little bit and we went up to a 310 and we got more rpm but we got no more speed i mean the car just would not go and then like i said the qualifying effort was just nothing we could do in your experience and we've talked about this on many occasions how when it comes time uh, when it comes to crunch time the racing community we we deal with it we see it on the track where we saw it at the very end of the daytona 500 for example where you've got a bunch of joe gibbs racing cars up there but on the last lap it's every man for himself when you were out there and you mentioned bobby hamilton coming and help, helping you out grand end finger offering up the number things like that did you find that racing community to be rather close-knit or what did you experience at daytona oh absolutely i mean i was getting phone calls i guess when we announced we we're going to daytona because a lot of people had been paying attention to what i'd been doing um, and you know how I got to the Arca series was basically uh, a, a letter that was written in the Pelham newsletter, <laughs> and a guy on a race team here, Peterson Motorsports, Anthony Freeman, saw okay. that article, and that's what kind of got me going. So a lot of people have known I, you know, we've had to work a whole different avenue. I feel like I'm running for uh, president, you know, and <laughs> I mean because really uh, you have to become a politician. When you do not have the financial backing, the family help, I mean, basically what I have to do is go out and take opportunities like today and try our best to get our story out there because we are a little different from everybody else. We have to work extremely hard, and we're very grateful for everything we get. So mm -hmm. motorsports means the world to me. My granddad was in the sport uh, and gave me the taste of it, and you mentioned Davey a while ago. That was part of our deal. We had to graduate high school like Bobby did Davey, and then we got to go race, and unfortunately, that didn't happen. He passed away when I was a sophomore. Right. So, you know, here we are, 36. I made it to Daytona. Okay. So. <laughs> you mentioned you started Birmingham International Raceway. It's where I got started when it came to being in, in the racing side of it, obviously on the PA side of it. I've only had the chance to be in behind a wheel one time, and I loved it. But unfortunately, the event that I was going to be in in a media race got rained out. So I'd keep bugging late model Mark out of Talladega Short Track <laughs> to do something else. But Constantly. that's another story entirely. <laughs> I remember your name from out there at Birmingham International Raceway. Uh, and, you know, all the names that were out there and all those guys that raced out there, Billy Melvin and so many others that uh, I could go on and on and on. Quite frankly, when you went to Birmingham International Raceway and you started to go to other tracks, we always had the phrase, if you, if you can win at Birmingham, you can race anywhere else. Did you find that to be true? Uh, yeah, I was. Yeah, my grandfather, Jimmy Evans, I, that's one thing I've, I've always said. You race well there, you're going to go anywhere. But I actually went from that to something I thought was absolutely insane, was went from Birmingham to dirt. Oh, okay. I looked, I looked at dirt racing and said, there's no way I can do that 
and and just somehow the good lord shifted me to the dirt tracks and man what a great opportunity that was <laughs> and what a lot of fun it was um, we went out one our very first time on dirt and they uh 800 horsepower dirt car didn't even know what we were doing i'll match the gas because there was so much <laughs> dust in front of me to go around people i wound up being the leader i don't know how that worked out we won he figured out he i want to see it out. clean air there we that's go. it i just I go fast turn left and go fast where was that win uh that was uh dan and Cl- uh uh, not Clanton. It was in Wilsonville. I ran Wilsonville. a bunch down in Wilsonville. We oh, did wow. some stuff in Clanton, yeah. did some stuff in Talladega. Mm-hmm. So I'm actually this year looking like we don't have anything announced for yet, but uh, maybe getting to make some laps around Talladega Short Track again this year. I'm really excited. Nice. I'll drive a grocery cart if they uh, make it look good, I guess, or, <laughs> or fit me in it, I guess you'd say. See, that's what I like to hear. That's a racer right there. <laughs> if it's there. got wheels, if I'll If it's take got it. wheels and a motor, give it to me. I'll take it. <laughs> I love it. Uh, as far as going up from here, have you have, – in, in thinking about it, obviously, you've always dreamed about it. You just mentioned it. You know, it was the dream as a kid to be able to go to a Daytona. Did you ever feel like and have that confidence that this was where you were going to be at this point in time? Oh, no. Uh, actually, I, I heard somebody say it yesterday, a cup driver. Well, actually, Denny Hamlin said he thought he was going to win the Daytona 500 10 years before he actually did. I thought I was going <laughs> to, yeah, I thought by now I'd, I'd be on my private jet, you know, <laughs> enjoying the NASCAR life. But, yeah, I mean, um, you know, as a child, you, you have the dream and, um it just doesn't, you know, you just have to let your path happen, you know, and, mm-hmm. and, and go with what you're given and be blessed for what opportunities you do have. And uh, we got a lot more coming. You know, I think you get better like a uh, like a wine, better like with that. age. And that's there, what, hey, there you go. And you got like more it. experience go. in life. You know, we've had the ups and downs of life and things of that nature. So, uh, you know, I think that's something great we can bring to a sponsor out there and, uh, and do them right, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, Camping World Truck Series is at Atlanta this weekend. You had mentioned the fact that you were you were talking about some possible Camping World Truck Series. Uh, obviously, not this weekend since you're here in studio. We apologize for that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but that said, they've got a, a break that's coming up here of about a month, and I'm sure that you're probably going to be burning up the phones, and hopefully they'll be burning yours up as well. Uh, we're looking to make a first start back at Gateway. Uh, okay. Yeah, that'll be our first start this year. Is what our plan is. There, there's a there's a, a wild chance we could make Martinsville. Oh, uh, but wow. we don't know yet for sure. Um, so we we're going to talk to Brett Bodine, who uh, that's your first step is to talk to Brett and go back and get your plan worked out with him because you know again we're gonna we have to do a plan to get to the next goal of Talladega in mm-hmm. a NASCAR sanctioned event. So. That's what I was hoping I could pull off this year. We'll see. Uh, it's up to Mr. Bodine. He's a great guy. I love him to death. Hope he's listening. And I'll be calling you Monday. <laughs> All right. I like it. <laughs> love to hear it. Uh, you got my information. Dustin will make sure that you have his as well, uh, and, and we'll get it out there because we're certainly going to be big champions of it. As you know, mentioned it before, we remember the Alabama gang, and while we may have uh, – you're younger than I am. Uh, I'm older than you are. I think you two are, give or take, right about the same age. Yeah. I can remember when it was Neil Bonnet and the Allisons, and, well, Red Farmer was already pretty much done in NASCAR by that point in time, but I still remember them towards the tail end of their heyday, into the 1980s is when I really, really got into NASCAR racing. And since then, we've lacked that Alabama presence in there. So it's exciting. I, I want to root for, and I have this real um uh, I, I almost have to restrain myself out at a Talladega when you see a Mike Harmon, who's a big-time underdog because he's running his own stuff, a Grand M. Finger, a Daryl Wallace Jr., a Joey G- a Gettina. I'm, I'm still going back to Gettina, yeah. and I'm going yeah. to smack myself every time I do it. Um, <laughs> so whenever I get to look on the entry list and I see that there's somebody who was born right here in this state, I automatically want to root for them and see them make, uh, make it in this sport because we have been central to the formation of NASCAR in so many ways. So that's why I want to see it succeed. So trust me, you've got two, well, three actually in him, three people on this show that are going to be rooting for you all the way. Well, I appreciate that. And yeah, I mean, this state, uh, I think we owe, or NASCAR owes us a lot. I mean, this state produced a, a lot of talent. And uh, yeah, Alabama gang, I mean, that that's that's why a lot of us do this. Um, you know, growing up mm-hmm. with uh, Neil and Bobby, Davey, you know, go down the list. I got a chance to meet Bobby a few times, and when I see him, it's just like starstruck, you know. So <laughs> it is. It's easy to do that. I got to hang out with uh, his brother um, a few weeks. Well, it's been a while ago, but got to hang out with him a little bit. So yeah, I mean, any chance you get ar- to get around legends like that, and knowing they're right from right here, mm-hmm. it's a, it's a heck of an opportunity. Have they? Have you had the chance to really kind of talk with them at all, or is there a particular racer that you kind of have latched onto as kind of a mentor? You know, I've, I've not. Um, 
you know, they, they've had their own family members, you know, trying to get into the sport. And that's, you know, um, so you kind of, I don't know. It's, I, it's probably something I need to do more. I know Bobby Hamilton Jr. is kind of helping me out a good bit. Mm-hmm. You know, he's actually, uh, he's going to let me drive for him at the uh, last race in Kansas this year. Mm-hmm. Um, so he, he's, uh, he's stepped up to help me out there. Um, other than that, I really, you know, it's so difficult to make it in this sport. It, it's... You can get all the advice you want, but if you do not have a business plan put together and a good marketing team behind you, you're you're not going to go very far. And I get a lot of people all the time. They ask, you know, or, or they they think I'm just this miracle worker and can find all these sponsors. This is years and years and years and years of contacts and and continuing on down that line. And today we sit, in, and I feel like a really good opportunity. Um, do we ever get a chance to go full time racing? I don't. I don't know. I, do I want to go full time racing? I don't know. I think this Charlie Glotchback scenario of running, <laughs> uh, which that's something that needs to come back too, because I think you can sure. offer a great sponsor the opportunity to go to these bigger events. And when I'm not racing, we can be pushing that sponsor where mm-hmm. all these guys running 33, 36 races a year. You know, if uh, you got a one off. You got that weekend, sure. so we we got a little extra time we can put in with our sponsors and prepare and have a really good event. Yeah, that seems like a lot of issues is the fact that you know, there's just so much going on at all the time. So when you put out something like that where you could actually give the sponsors some more love, oh yeah, they're going to be liking that. And that's the, a lot of people don't realize. I mean, it makes it makes an awesome point is the fact that it's not something that happens overnight with the sponsors. I mean, you have to you're you're there with them. You're constantly meeting with them over and over and over before you actually get to that point where they're like, you know, they feel comfortable enough. So it's not just something that happens overnight. A lot of people think, "Oh, you can just throw this stuff together." There's your proof right there. Mm-hmm. When it comes to time and and obviously over the course of racing time, you've had a number of uh, likely uh, I would say likely You've had a number of sponsors over the course of time. Have you been in contact with any of them about maybe helping you out? Oh yeah, yeah. We we we've got some new things happening, and I'm I'm very happy. I've got a marketing team behind me right now, and one guy in particular. And I've asked him. I said, "Well, can I mention your name? Can I mention the company?" He said, "No, we're Delta Force." Oh, you know? <laughs> and, and when he told me that, I said, "I've got the right people here." You know? <laughs> yeah, I, like I, that. I agree. That's I nice. agree. Yeah, it's I, I want to give them the press, but you know what? I can't complain if he says, "Hey, we're Delta Force." All right, we're out. <laughs> he said, "You know, I, you know, we just don't want anyone else." This is they work with a lot of country music acts and and have done a lot of racing over the years. And uh, once I finally put this together, I got a free contract with them for uh, for basically this year. So. It's awesome to have that kind of support because even again, uh, when you're in my position and you're trying to find this help, it's expensive. And then there's a lot of people out there you really have to do your research on. Mm-hmm. Okay, and and I've got fortunate enough that they came to me and they're putting their belief in what we're doing here. Because nice, I, and I, I think that we got something great together. I really do. Um, I'm just ready to get back in the race car. You know, after Daytona. And the business side is wonderful. <laughs> hey, he started bouncing. I know. He's like, I want to get Daytona. back in the car. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, we're, we're looking to be back at Talladega for sure in the Arca Series. Uh, okay. We're still going to be bouncing back to, to anything and everything that we can get back behind the wheel sure. of. Uh, we may have a Alabama-based race team going to Talladega, which I'm pretty excited about. Nice. Mm-hmm. Okay. I've, I've been hearing. Oh, stuff. I haven't. Okay, I'm I'm on the outside looking in. Yeah, well, let's let's put it this way. There was somebody from South Alabama that contacted me not too long ago and liked our logo. So hopefully that'll mean some good stuff for the show as well. <laughs> and if hey, if if it comes up to the point where we can team up with with Joey right here, all the better. I say, what is this Delta Force all around? I mean, <laughs> we'll talk. All, we'll talk during the break. Don't worry about it. Um, but that said, when it comes time to getting into the car, you mentioned the fact that you've got one Camping World Truck Series start under your belt. Only the one. Is yeah. that the only time you've been in a in a race truck? Uh, yeah, and you know how that happened. You know we had uh, we've had a rough go at it. And I hope we can get our story out there a little bit more because that's the politics of what we're talking about doing here is just getting our story out and what we've been through. But we actually in 2015, I believe, we're supposed to run Talladega and the Arca Series, and we gave our our team owner, our sponsor, money and and our money and everything it took to go run that race, and then we got a phone call Wednesday that we didn't have a race car to drive. Oh no! So and we still have not got our money back. And, oh. and people in the Arkansas community probably know oh, what no. what that was about. So mm. so we've had a lot of. I think and, I do. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think I. I think, I I think do. we know that story. Yeah. I think I do. We, we were hearing some rumors. I didn't realize that you were slated to I be was, the driver, but yeah. we had heard the story about two. the car. Yeah, I just put yeah. two and two together. Not, not only me, but another great friend of mine were scheduled to be in that same car. So mm. uh, you know, Norm Ben. Uh, found out about it and Norm called me on a Monday and um, 
asked me if I wanted to come to Gateway and start a truck. It wasn't nice. to go be a race car driver. It was to kind of get your foot in the door and let's start a program together, you know, with NASCAR and, and, and running the second truck and things of that nature. So we got up there and, you know, NASCAR was so great working with me. I got my NASCAR approval done in like a week. Nice. Uh, that's, oh, wow. that's all the stuff that you have to do, uh, your, your testing and impact testing and stuff like that. We didn't even have time to take the drug test for NASCAR. They allowed us to use the ARCA's drug test. It's <laughs> just so I could go to Gateway. And then we did the official stuff when we went the next week to Iowa. So okay. we were supposed to have ran to Iowa as well, started the race, I'll put it that way, start the race, but it got up there and it just didn't make good sense because you would have had to knock a good friend of mine out, Mike Afriano, for me to make the race. Mm -hmm. And I knew I wasn't going to be on the track long, so I elected a spot and uh, got to hang out with Alabama's own Jimmy Kitchens. Nice. And uh, on the roof. And uh, so in, in a couple of weeks in NASCAR, started a truck, got to change some tires and, ask, and a pit stop. And be a spotter, so I've I've kind of experienced now. Does that experience of being uh, doing things other than just being behind the wheel does that help you understand some of the other things that are that you're hearing or dealing with when you're behind the wheel? I I guess it could, yeah. But I mean, as far as the spotting stand of it uh, side of it, it's it's you want to jump off the spotter stand because you want to <laughs> be in the car. So. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. But no, I mean, you, you you can find a positive with anything, and if you're if you're closed minded to not learning, then you're not going to get very far as well. So that's sure. something you got to take advantage of every opportunity. There's something in there that. Even it's just the respect for what your guys are having to do to keep you on the racetrack. That's something you're gonna, you know, make sure you're aware of as well. Yeah, I know that not all the spotters are former drivers, but I have always heard from different drivers, and I haven't had the chance to talk to them directly. But in reading interviews with different drivers or different spotters now who were drivers, like a Jimmy Kitchens, they mention the fact that their experience as a driver helps them understand what the driver in the car might be looking for when they say clear low, clear high, you know, whatever lengths and things like that did you find that to be true uh yeah and even the biggest thing was selecting a spotter for daytona you know luckily you know i've worked for dale jarrett at the racing adventure for i don't know nine years i guess it was when they were in, around in existence so i got to know the jarrett family real well mm -hmm. and jason jarrett was like one of the main people that helped me out this whole process uh, selecting a spotter you know jody franklin here from trustville alabama's great friends with jimmy kitchens right so i i was you know we talked earlier about pulling resources or, or asking for advice those are kind of the people i went to jason and and jody and and jimmy um as far as what i needed to do and and there is there's three or four different kind of spotters and jason wouldn't let me go with certain ones that i wanted to go with and, and we wound up when he told me that uh that we could have jimmy johnson's spotter um i was pretty floored and it was great <laughs> Um, I never got to hear new leader 14, but <laughs> <laughs> well, Hey, all in time because yeah. <laughs> we're going to be pressing for that as well. We would love to see that in that, in that process. Uh, you mentioned St. Louis. Uh, I, I know enough of Iowa. I've seen it on television to know what kind of a track it is. Truth be told, I don't know if I've ever actually seen Gateway Motorsports Park. How, what kind of a track is it? It's nasty. Uh, it's about a mile track, I believe. Um, but it's long, long straightaways and very flat narrow tight corners so if it's you almost drove, like a large martinsville yeah yeah if you okay. drove out there in a, in a rental car you'd be like there's no way you're gonna race out here <laughs> yeah we went up there to do an event with a del jet racing adventure with snap on and we had a uh rental car out there and we had a guy like to scare us a little bit when he was driving and then they warned me about that so it was my time to drive so I scared him. We went down in turn one at Gateway and on two wheels in a uh, <laughs> Suburra. It was a tile, I think it was. So we were on two wheels, and I looked over, and his arms and legs were pinned against the wall. So every time I go there, I'm kind of, you know, going to Gateway is very intimidating. And that's one thing I'm blessed with the seat time I have. Yes, it's in school cars, but you cannot replace going to a track. I know I've been on Talladega. I don't know how many thousands of laps I have there, but going to Daytona, I, you know, I went to turn one the first time. I was like, well, what in the world is this? I mean, you know, both similar tracks, but entrance in the corners are completely different. I've so. also heard that coming off a of turn four at Daytona is a lot different than coming off a of turn four at Talladega. Absolutely, yeah. How much? Well, I mean, you're driving the car at Daytona. You don't really have to drive the car at Talladega. That says a lot. That's true. I've heard a lot of people say you can actually get real, real loose coming off a of turn four at Daytona. You can drive Talladega with two fingers. I'd like to try that. I you know, I'm probably not. I would like to have both hands firmly well, and on the I, standing I, I've wheel. Said this. I've, I've said this on many, many occasions, and my wife actually looked into the Dale Jarrett thing at one point in time, but uh, she never, she didn't pull the trigger on it. I would love to be able to go down there because I, we, 
I had my car through the trioval at one point in time, and Dustin was actually taking video of it. I had to. It was too good. <laughs> but we ended up stopping at the start finish line because we were covering an event from uh, one of the local officer training courses mm-hmm. out there at Aniston Army Depot. And you look out and you see this big towering banked curve. And it is a little intimidating. And then to think, okay, you're supposed to be in a race car. You're supposed to have the gas matted. You're supposed to have it floored. Do I have the guts to put that thing on the floor and not lift off going into that corner with five stories of asphalt? Uh, And, you know, how intimidating is that? Is is there an intimidation factor for you from the first time you ever went on to Talladega? Or were you able to just go, you know what, go? I think the worst, and I hate to admit this, but I'm claustrophobic. Okay. Bad. So being claustrophobic in a race car driver does not work out Doesn't real well. Really, no. mm. Yeah. So that's the only thing I've ever had to get through uh, was that side of it. Once you get in the race car, you finally fire it up and you're rolling. Everything goes out the window. So okay. you don't even really pay attention to going when you're into the banks and everything else. You're just focusing so much on what's going on in front of you that you just kind of that tidal wave of asphalt is not even in your mind at that point. Yeah. I mean, just. Mine's clear and just wow. enjoying the ride. Nice. Wow. That, I've only been on it one time in a car. Uh, I was working, this was 97, 98, and Mercedes was celebrating 10 years of being here in Alabama. And they had one of their M-Class SUVs with a professional driver, and they were taking us around. And so I'm sitting in the passenger seat of an M-Class car, and we're going through turn one, and I look over at the driver, and then I look out his window mm-hmm. as we're going turn one, turn two, and you see nothing but asphalt. And it's a little intimidating because uh, yeah. you're looking for grass oh, and yeah. sky and things that you would normally see, and it's just it's ground, it's asphalt. Oh, yeah. And then you look out here, and there's this big wall and this little sliver of, of sky. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a little weird. It messes but with it was you. fun, and that was before it was paved. Uh, okay. So they still had that dip over the tunnel turn. I never got to have that or experience the dip. That dip in the tunnel turn upset the electronics on that M class at 125 miles an hour. And when that dashboard lit up like a Christmas tree, the driver freaked out. And I'm like, okay, don't freak out in the middle of turn four. No, no, don't do that. That's not bad. That's, that's bad. Bad, bad juju. Bad <laughs> so that's, juju. that's the only experience that I've had uh, actually being on the track at any kind of a speed out there. But yeah, I would love to try it. And to be in the position that you're in is just fascinating. And you've got humongous cheerleaders here oh yeah well and i say you know i was talking about that there is one difficult part of of running talladega and that's to run the top lane against the wall wide open that Mm -hmm. is something that took some time and uh to get used to and luckily i had that opportunity to train myself uh to to drive up there um you know our lead instructor jody franklin at the time i I was scared to death i was worried i was going to wreck a school car trying to do this and (laughs) i came back in and he said i said man i just don't know man i just I, i just having issues i can't drive the car up there wide open I'm scaring me at the wall. And he goes, where are you looking? And I said, out the windshield. And then, of course, the slap to the back of the head was, hey, you know. And, and Don't do that. It, yeah. Well, yeah. no, it was like, you know, the, the, my personal you know, little comment, out the windshield. But, no, it's, you know, look out <laughs> as far as you can. Mm-hmm. And and from there, you know, drive the car. And when I did, I went out the next time and wide open, foot on the floor, looked at as far as I could and drove right around the track on the outside. So that's something you definitely want to have that experience going into these tracks because that's big time of qualifying if you can't run up against the wall and the first couple of times you get down there you know that's that's killing speed as well yeah. too. and well we've been seeing it uh during the course of the event as well as time ran out on us yeah joey thank you so much thank you joey we appreciate it we were rolling down this road in anbar province three personnel carriers with 16 of us on board all of a sudden, there's, there's a huge explosion. We knew right away it, it was an IED. The first vehicle got, got wasted, and those guys took a, a huge hit. Then we started taking sniper, sniper fire and RPGs from the hills. In today's military, women face the same dangers as men. It's pretty amazing. We made it out alive. But when they come home, women veterans confront a whole different set of challenges, like unique health care issues, or not receiving respect or even acknowledgement for serving in harm's way. DAV understands the problems women veterans face, and we can help. Many DAV advisors are female veterans. They've been there, and they're ready to provide expert guidance. DAV fights to get you the health, disability, and financial benefits you were promised and earned. If you're a veteran, visit DAV.org for free help. 
Springtime is almost among us, and with spring comes new things, like spring cleaning and starting fresh. How about this spring be the time you start fresh and finally put down those cigarettes? This could be the best time to finally do what you've always wanted, whether it be for yourself or for loved ones. You can finally drop those cigarettes with the help of Wild Vapors in Silicaga and Alexander City. Eddie and Shelly, the owners, were once former smokers themselves. They knew firsthand the struggle. They started Wild Vapors because they knew they could offer something the other places couldn't. They have their very own signature formula that has helped so many others to finally put down cigarettes. With their unique blend, they use only the highest USB ingredients and leave out all those artificial sweeteners and other unnecessary chemicals, all made up in an off-site clean room. They're located in the Silicaga Walmart Shopping Center and Alexander City, but they can also take orders over the phone and mail in your products. Call 256-369-2569. That's 256-369-2569. 369-2569. Stay on track with Wild Vapors. The only show that covers NASCAR, IndyCar, and Formula One. The fastest hour in radio on Superstation 101. Hey, welcome back into the fastest hour in radio. It's the 8 o'clock hour here on Superstation 101. We had a great talk with Joey Giacchina uh, in the last hour there, that last half hour with him. So uh, very, very thankful for him to come in. Now it's all about the one, the only, Cruz Skinner in studio right now. So if you want to give a call in, uh, talk to Cruz, question for Cruz, maybe a, you know want to give him a comment or something like that, you can. Local, 941-1011. Uh, you can also call toll free 866-551-9933. So, finally, the 2015 Talladega Short Track Neesmith Crate Track Champion and the 2015 Sunoco Young Guns Challenge Series Champion, the one and only Crew Skinner. What's up, buddy? Not much. What about you? No, not, you? not too bad. It's not too bad. It's uh, been a little, little while since we got a chance to talk to you. We had you in last year uh, in the middle of the season, kind of coming in and talking about some stuff. And it's great to have you back. You accomplished so much in the last year in the 2015 season. Congratulations! Uh, thank you. I, I really appreciate it, and um, I really I really appreciate you coming back and having me on your show. Yeah. Well, hey, the door is always open whenever you want to come in. Um, you know, there's been a lot of things that have happened so far into the 2016 season. We're, we're already. I mean, I know you guys don't really have an off season. You're prepping for that 2016 season. What kind of stuff did you work on during the off season? What kind of things did you do? Did you get any time to actually just be cruise? <laughs> uh, yes, sir. I mean, I, I had a little bit of time, hung out with some friends, you know, had had some fun. And, um, I got down to the shop some and, you know, just clean, helped clean everything up. You know, we took the cars apart and greased them and lubed them and got everything ready. And now we're ready to um, come out hot and start winning races. Yeah, about to say, I saw a couple of pictures, you know, on your Skinner Motorsports page, uh, the, the Halloween parade. You're out there with all the kids <laughs> and stuff. And then the Christmas parade, got to see all that. Uh, what kind of... What's that do for you when you when you kind of see the kids out there? You know, you were in their position. You know, you were in their position. You know, looking up at other drivers and stuff. What's that for like for you to go out and experience time with the kids? Oh yes, sir. I mean, that, that that's really just an awesome feeling being being able to get and lead the parade in the car. And you know, I, I was in their position. You know, sit there watching, looking at all the cool floats, shiny shiny lit up, and they let you fire the car up. Oh yes, sir. Oh, okay. They let you fire the car. Yes, sir. I mean, that's just one. That's one of the awesome things I get to do, and I, mean, I really appreciate everybody that gives me the opportunity to do that. And I, I feel very fortunate to have the opportunity to do that. Now you going into the 2016 season. We had the ice bowl not too long ago. Seems like it was forever ago, and it wasn't that long ago. But uh, you, uh, you kind of came out. You were running the crate lights. You ran the super lights, kind of threw everybody for a firestorm real quick, and you come out for the super lights. But talk about uh, the crate lights first. Let's hear about the crate lights, uh, how your run was. Uh, you uh, finished sixth in the crate light um, model division there. Over 300 entries out there for the crate lights, I believe it was. Um, we, we had close to about 40 or 50 crate light models. Oh, okay, the crate lights. 300 entries all, all total together. for the weekend. There we go. So you finished sixth out of all those, all those out there. Uh, talk about the race 
a little bit uh first of all on on the just the people that showed up to race i mean there's some of the best great racers in the country right there racing and i mean it was really awesome being able to race against all those guys that usually uh, some of them don't always travel and they travel downtown to go short track and it's just a lot of fun racing with new faces and faces i haven't raced in with for a while and i mean we we overall we had a great weekend and the practice stays we was always near the top of the top of the charts and we had a little problem in qualifying with a car and we qualified six in our group but we came back finished third in our heat race started i believe we started what 14th 14th it was and um and um got our way up to six which is a great run for the ice bowl with the immense competition and such great drivers and like i said i just really enjoyed racing with everybody now was it different for you you were talking about the new faces you know you don't get a chance to race against and stuff like that did that help you more um you know kind of elevate yourself in the car as well kind of get you a little bit of you know experience against other people that you haven't run against kind of learning anything out of that that you could apply later on oh yes sir i mean it's always a good experience when you're racing against people that you've never raced against before I mean, some of them have driving styles that's totally different from anybody else, which is which is really cool to be able to be able to race against. You have to go out there try to figure out what they're going to do, how they race, and how you're going to get by them, or how you're going to stay in front of them. And I mean, yes, that I mean, that definitely helps me out a lot with experience. And I mean, I really I really enjoy it. Now, what did you do when you moved over to the super lights? How much of the crate lights moved over to the super light? What kind of uh, changes did you? that you were waiting for that actually happened and what kind of things weren't you expecting that did happen i mean the the biggest thing i took from crate late models was um you know just that experience of being in a late model but i mean, I, I had to change a couple things for the super like throughout where to pick up throttle braking points stuff like that because you're if you obviously have more horsepower then um i also had to control the gas a little bit more not being able to get on the gas as much as as a crate late model being how slick it is and um one thing that threw me for uh, threw me off a little bit was uh, my dad told me that it's going to turn a good bit of rpms in the crate late model you're usually turning about 6500 rpm well um i get on i get on it out there and um it's turning about 8500 rpms i'm thinking <laughs> oh crap <laughs> i mean <laughs> that's not what you want to hear dad is it <laughs> hey he warned you <laughs> <laughs> he, he, he did warn me but um i, I got i got, that's just something that um i wasn't used to with the uh smaller motor different different um computer stuff like that but i mean i really enjoyed it and learned a lot in the process of going from crate late to super late models, uh, when did you? When was the decision made to do that? Uh, I mean, we we um we ran a couple five twenty five stuff last year, just kind of trying to ease into that higher motor class. And um, this year, over the off season, we got a super spec motor, and um, that's when we really said that we are going to go run a decent amount of super late model races and. And that's what that's what we're going to do this year just kind of run some crate late model and super late model stuff and just travel around and get more experience did it help you uh was was the first time in the crate late model at talladega short track uh actually my first time in a crate late model was uh, uh, i'm sorry su super late model su that was super oh yes sir um besides the 525 motor which is a little bit which is um doesn't have quite as much power as the spec motor um, in the spec motor, first time was at Taldig, and I believe it was at, in the 525 too. Did it help you being in a, in a track that you know so well to have that the the unfamiliar motor, but a familiar track at least? Oh yes, yeah, sir, definitely. I mean, that's one of the things that helped me out so much was I I, I know that track so well, and I've raced on it for this will be my fifth year racing on it, I believe, counting hot shots and all that. And I grew up going to that track, and I've really enjoyed it. Just going out there and watching my my heroes facing their their um their competition and you know i grew up watching people like ronnie johnson and tim rozell racing so okay. i mean that's just something that really helped me out a lot being at a track that I, that I really know well all right phone lines are open by the way if you want to talk to crew skinner uh nine four one one zero one one toll free eight six six five five one ninety nine thirty three guy on the phone right now quite familiar with your activities out of talladega short track we bring in late model mark hello 
Good morning, Senor. I just uh, caught a few bits and pieces of your show with uh, your uh, Joey uh, on there earlier, and I uh, heard that uh, Mr. Skinner was on there, and of course, Cruz, nice job, uh, and his very sneaky dad, uh, Greg, you know what I'm talking about, with the sneaky job, he pulled at the ice pole, you pulled the, you pulled the wool over Mark, uh, Mark Skinner's eyes, too, and when I saw that uh, number 11 come out for Super Late Model Hot Laps, I go, okay. That's how you roll. I got it. But, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, I'm glad uh, Cruz is uh, up in the super division. I hope you still run a little bit of crates. I don't know if you've mentioned that. I don't know what your story is. But tonight, ladies and gentlemen, is the 2015 Talladega Short Track Awards Banquet at the Oxford Civic Center tonight, which should be a whole lot of fun. Yours truly will be emceeing it for the very first time. And, uh, I'm ready to go. And Mr. Skinner, besides getting his Neesmith Young Gun deal, uh, with the Neesmith series and a nice top 10 finish. Uh, we'll be getting a little gold tonight for the Crate Late Model Championships, and uh, I'm looking forward to awarding that uh, to him tonight. And, you know, uh, you mentioned okay. that, and uh, we got to take you to task a little bit here, Late uh -oh. Model Mark. Uh, as much as we have tried to help out each other over here, we wanted to be there, and we had to go through other connections to get our tickets to go to the banquet. Well, that was a brain fart on my end. I guess. <laughs> I'm, oh, I'm overdosing on salt and potato chips right now. I'm in the back of the chip truck. That's how dedicated I am, Steve. But we're looking forward to seeing you tonight. That was uh, my bad on that one. But don't worry, we're going to be there. We're going to invade the uh, the banquet tonight. Yes, we are. And we're going to make so much noise you will not be able to ignore us. Mm -hmm. Outstanding. Here, a couple of tidbits on the Talladega Short Track. Our season opener will be Saturday, April. Second, mark it on your calendar. Okay. We will have two practice dates on March 12th and March 19th. There will two, at least two practices for the season opener. Uh, the final bid has been accepted on the tower. Construction could start within a matter of days. Nice. Uh, a gentleman cool. named Todd Hurst is going to be doing from what uh, Lynn Phillips has uh, told me. And it's going to be pretty much the same deal. It may or may not be ready to go for the season opener, but tech. I'll announce standing on top of a crate with a piece of paper if I have to. But, uh, <laughs> I don't we'll think you'll have to worry about that too much. Yes, and like something that Mrs. Late Model Mark always asked me to mention is when you go to the Talladega Short Track, if you've got a kid 10 and under, they get in for free. You know, I always fail to a mention good point. that. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's always a great under. point. <clears throat> yes, yes um, Mrs. is always very practical and yeah. it keeps me steered in the right direction. Well, and we but, like uh, to talk about it. You know, I remember what the tickets were out of the old Birmingham International Raceway, and it is, it's a very affordable night. I mean, we think about some of the things that you can do with the entire family. You go and try and take a family of four or five to a movie, and suddenly you're out 75 bucks, and that's before you get your, your uh, commit, uh, concessions and all that kind of stuff. It's a lot more affordable, and quite frankly, a lot more fun to go out to a Talladega short track. Absolutely. And uh, pardon the pun here, but also our concessions, concessions I feel, are dirt cheap compared to a lot of uh, other places that I've been to, especially a lot of the California tracks. And you can bring a cooler in with food and drink. As long as there's no glass, you can bring in the world. And that uh, just makes it easier for families. Hey, you pay the admission, you bring a cooler with your Sammies and maybe a cold adult beverage or a soda for the kids and enjoy yourself so you don't have to get uh, creamed at the concession stand, but if you do, our prices are reasonable. So, overall, uh, I'm ready for the season to get going. It's been a couple of months off. We had that ice bowl, and uh, I'm ready to get into some Saturday night action and hear some super late models and crates and all that good stuff and uh, start up uh, start up the season. So I'm looking high forward to it, and I'm sure your gentlemen will be with us quite a bit. And, Greg, you're still a sneaky dude. Cruz, good luck. <laughs> i got to go back to work. We'll talk to you later, guys. Bye-bye. Hey. Late, 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 late model mark there you talked about cruz getting that uh gold tonight just make sure you got my name on that check buddy <laughs> uh, you know what i just want to tell you greg that uh, i'm the dude with the microphone in my hand and i can i can do wonders with that thing <laughs> don't be making eye contact with me <laughs> anyways congratulations on your championships and uh I'm ready to rock in 2016. I think it's going to be a special year at the short track and uh, in dirt racing overall. You guys have a good one. I unfortunately have to go back to work and earn a little living here. So go get it done, man. We'll, talk to you. well we'll be seeing you real, real soon. And uh, looking forward. To, that's great news to hear that they finally got everything set and they're going to begin uh, work on that tower. And if you are unfamiliar with what happened, it was a couple of months ago. It was just before the ice bowl. Exactly right before the ice bowl. Yeah, mm -hmm. that uh, we found out that, and I'm not even sure that they found out the reason why it caught on fire 
but the concession stand slash tower, which it's a three-story building, concession stand on the bottom, uh, and so on, it caught on fire and yeah. burned, I mean, burned to the ground. It was horrible. It was so, so weird to see that when we went out for the ice yes, bowl. Yes, exactly. But and the community they, support was amazing. Absolutely, yeah. There are a lot of other tracks coming up uh, from nearby local dirt and asphalt tracks, both coming and bringing concession trucks and food trucks and things like that to come sell. So they had plenty of food. One of the local pizza places was just constantly having a delivery driver going out there, mm-hmm, coming back to the store, mm-hmm. picking up a whole bunch more and going back pizza? out and delivering it and things like that. Uh, I actually didn't get pizza. Yeah, he didn't get pizza. <laughs> <laughs> he was a little busy. He was a little busy. Well, he was a little busy. He's, so we understand. He's been busy already this year. Absolutely. Yeah. I, not only Ice Bowl, you have uh, not been resting on your laurels, so to speak, waiting for racing season to start. You've already been traveling quite a bit. Oh uh, yes, sir. I mean, this so far this year we've been to Talladega Short Track, the Ice Bowl, and we went to Boyd Speedway in Ringgold, Georgia, up there by Chattanooga, Tennessee, and for the Cabin Fever, and we actually had a pretty good run. But um, I just want to say real quick. Um, Going off what Lake Motor Mark said, how um, it's a lot cheaper to go to a dirt track, and that's one of the things I loved loved about dirt track growing up. I mean, it's all it's usually just a great family environment, and I mean, you just take your family out and have lots of fun. Yeah, absolutely. That said, another guy who's out there who's quite familiar with all of your activities out there, and a guy who you're going to be racing against for a while if he can turn the radio down so that we don't get so much feedback. Come on, Jay. Is Jay Schiller? <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Jay. How are you? What's up, buddy? How are you? I'm doing pretty good this morning. Yeah? I hear I, that... I'd uh, be better if I was on a radio show, but somebody's going to take my spot. That's all right. We're good to have you next week. I got it. I'm, I'm going to get a whole hour. I ain't going to get a half hour. <laughs> hey, do, do I need to come next week, too? Uh, sure. Why not? Come on, Cruz. Hey, come on. We, 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 we can have a real good conversation. I think one-on-one... Race. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, I tell you what, Cruz, you get my car and I get in yours. Uh, I, don't, I don't know about that one. <laughs> <laughs> now all of a sudden he's hedging his bets. <laughs> I say we get a couple of go karts and we make a little track out of the parking lot out here. Oh, yeah. Broadcasting and we'll oh, see what yeah. they can hey, do there. Go to over. I, even, I even got old Dylan Krim here at the shop with me this morning. You got who? Dylan Krim. Oh, okay. Who is Dylan? Uh, Seven Super Late Mall. Are you familiar with Dylan? Are you familiar with Dylan? Oh yes, sir. Um, I am. I I hung out with Dylan a little bit. And, um, hey, well, um, if Dylan's still over, ask him how he's doing for me. Dylan's still hanging out with you, Jay. Oh yeah, Dylan's right here in the shop right now. All right. Uh, Cruz asked him how he was doing today. Hold on. Say. Yeah, well, uh, pretty much, how you doing? <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to live radio. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I hear you're gearing up for a pretty good season, too, here, Jay, right? I'm trying to. Yeah, and uh, maybe you've got an announcement for next week. We're going to tease that big stuff coming. Uh, we're going to try to run the we're going to try to run the Mississippi State Series. Oh, there it is. All right, we'll see what else we can get ourselves into next week when Jay is up here at the, at the studio next week. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it may be. So, all right, we're looking forward to to seeing both uh, both you, D- Dylan. Feel free, come on up with Jay next week, okay? I'm gonna, I'm gonna do that. All right, I love it. We'll just hey, let's have a whole big room full of people oh, yeah. and just make it all kinds of fun. Oh, all kinds of fun. I love it. Very good stuff. All right, uh, tell Jay take it easy. We'll see him up here in studio next week. Both you and uh, you and Dylan, okay? I think. Well, I'm, I'm not here. What are you gonna let the ghost up in for? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you're trying to be real fast now, ain't you? Just yes, I am, fast. because yes. our time's running out, my friend. <laughs> all right, well, I think y'all are not at the banquet. Yes. Yeah, yes, we'll be out there tonight. tonight, and we'll get all the details set up for next week, okay? All right, buddy. All right, bring Dylan up with all you right, next bye. week, too, okay? All right. I will. All right. Thanks, Jay. Appreciate it. They got a whole family out there. I know. It you know? really is. And and that's the fun thing about it. And we mentioned that. Uh, and we talked with Joey about it. We talked with so many other racers about it. And I'm sure you've experienced it throughout the course of time how racing is actually a, a pretty close knit community, all oh, things yeah. considered. Oh, yeah, sir. I mean, you go to the track, and I mean, if you're a local racer, I mean, you just know everybody. And if you're from out of town and you need something, just ask anybody, and they'll try to help you out as much as they can. And if if they don't have what you need, they'll tell you who does and who will help you. And, and that, that's another thing I love about dirt track racing. I mean, you just go, and it's just a whole family of dirt racers. And, I mean, they'll, they'll just help you out any way they can. And, I mean, you know, it's just a lot of fun being, out, being able to go out there and race against people you really know and 
you know, all through the week be texting them, hey, I beat you last weekend. <laughs> <laughs> a little well, bit of a nudge. Well, talking about, like, the, the whole family community type aspect out there, you know, on, on NASCAR side of the house, you got the Petties, the Allisons, the Waltrips, the Earnhardts and stuff. You know, um, you know we've gotten a chance to, to meet you, your dad, your family all out there. What does family mean to you out at the track when, the, when your family's out there in your corner supporting you each weekend? I mean, it just means the world when I see my family or get a text from my family, you know, good luck this weekend or when I see them at track. I mean, it, it just means the world to me to know that they're behind me. And I mean, that, that's really been a big, I mean, that's been a big part of my racing, being, have, having that support from my, not just my family, really my family and my friends. And I mean, I'm, I'm just, I just feel so fortunate now I have a family like them that's willing to come out to the track and and um, take their weekends away for me and come watch and support me. Yeah, that's right. very time consuming. We called you a hot shot here. How old are you exactly? Uh, actually, I'm 14 now. So. 14 <laughs> years old. Uh, love being in the dirt track scene. Would you be happy going up into like a world of outlaws and staying on dirt like for a racing career? Or do you see a transition to asphalt in the future? What are you thinking? Um, I mean, my ultimate goal is the um, NASCAR Spring Cup Series and... Um, and I'm actually going to reveal something right here. We actually have a test next month in New Smyrna with a team to um, try, try to start getting up there and you know climb our way through the ranks. So um, we're, we're working on it. But if I'm not fortunate enough to make it there, I mean, I'd be perfectly happy with um, going World of Outlaws or Lucas Racing, mm -hmm. stuff like that. And, I, you know, I just love the sport of racing. And that's just what I've wanted to do for, you know, since I was a little kid and been been able to remember racing. You're, you're, he's living the dream already. Absolutely, every you gotta love that. <laughs> well, and that's you know how many times have we talked about how many different drivers have gotten their start at the age of five, six, seven years old? Jeff Gordon, Tony Stewart, Jeff Gordon at five in a go kart competitively. Tony Stewart was in a go kart competitively at the age of seven, and and Dad obviously is you know this as well as anybody. You've been working real, real hard to try and help him out in getting this. First time you put him in a competitive car. When what? How old was he? Uh, and get, he he was five years old when we five started off in go karts. Cool. Then we made transition to a uh, a, a car, a front wheel drive, at age of ten. So, so wow, kind of uh, it almost seems rapid fire, but you know what? In the world of racing, it's really not. Yeah. Oh I mean, yeah. That's that's it. It's it seems moving quick with me being at the age of forty seven. Yeah, I'm old, uh, but <laughs> trust me, that's the way it is now. We'll There's be no there one day. <laughs> Way down the road. Yeah. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> Dad, Dad's in here now. This is the question. That, this one I'm, I'm extremely curious about. I told him we were going to hit him. We were going to hit him with a couple curveballs this week. All right. So here's the question. You know, you talked about how important family racing is to you. You're racing. Your dad's racing. It's you two in a race. Who wins the race, Cruz? <laughs> like how dad immediately started staring. Well, um, it depends on who puts the tires on the car. <laughs> <laughs> we've had this conversation before. And we've talked about this, but we haven't got to that match race it's yet. It's on record now. Well, 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 so, uh, now, hold on. I, I, I think I do remember a go-kart race. Do I remember correct? I, I don't really remember that, but but we're talking about a, a challenge in a car here. <laughs> <laughs> The go, the go kart, the go just, kart. Just go remember kart whose roof you're living under there, Chris. Does not count. <laughs> yeah. just, just for the record, I did win that go kart race. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, so super late crate light, late model. Who wins, Dad? We, we we've had this conversation before, and uh, I told him if he if it come down to that, like a match race, and we come to the line, he better not lift. Mm -hmm. Okay. Keep the competitive spirit. Just like that. I like it. Oh. Tell us about some of your sponsors real quick. Thank them on the year. Uh, I just really want to thank um, Skinner Body Shop, Skinner Motors, Neesmith, Dirt Lake Model Series, Austin Hines, um, Napa Auto Parts, Huddle House, Real Wheel Racing Wheels, Hoosier Racing Tire, and, um, um, Show and Field Headers, and, um, Boyd Speedway, Griffin Services, KSE, Kaiser. And um, I just want to thank all my family and crew for putting in all their time and, you know, throwing away their weekends for me and <laughs> supporting me. And uh, I just really appreciate all that. And then I just wanted to say something real important right here. Sure. Um, I just want to thank all everybody that um, has served or is serving for um, everything they do for this country. Amen. 
Very nice. Very we nice. gotta we gotta thank one of our own sponsors as well. Oh yes, we do. Wild Vapors in Silicaga. Thanks so much to them for being on board. It's been great to work with them each and every week. You can check them out too. You can find the way to get rid of the cigarettes by stopping down and talking to Shelly and Eddie Bowman down at Wild Vapors in Silicaga in Alexander City. Stop smoking, start vaping. Go to the uh, the healthy alternative with Wild Vapors. Call them today, 256-369-2569. Find them on Facebook as well. Uh, simply look up Wild Vapors and you can get them right there. Go down there, put the cigarettes down, go to vaping today with Wild Vapors in Silicaga and Alexander City. Take care of it and take care of it now. Going to be out at the banquet tonight for Talladega Short Track, so we'll see you guys out oh, there yeah. tonight. Looking forward to it. And we also want to say thanks to not only Crew Skinner and his dad. Thank you very much for bringing him in the, uh, yes, today because while he can drive a race car, he still can't drive a regular car. No, he, he, <laughs> he drove this morning. I was tired. Did he? Okay. Oh. <laughs> Won't tell that to the police. Uh, and we want to thank Joey Jatina as well. We thank them very much for coming in, and we look forward to being right back here next week. See ya!